having robotics taught in the school system here at Enfield. Uh, other schools participate in robotics also. Uh, many of those kids come into contact with NASA and doing those programs. We generate new engineers that are needed for future colonization when we get to that point. I'm going to pass a couple things around. Typically, this is called tiger eye. You might relate it to the tiger eye gem. Well, this is the raw stuff. It's iron. Where did the iron come from early on? It precipitated out of the ocean. As algae came along, a thing called spermatolites were growing, letting oxygen off. A lot of changes happened. You're looking at something here that's about 3.3 billion years old. That's back when that happened in that, that time period of the Earth. Here's something that's more recent, and it's banded iron also, and it's from South Pass in Wyoming. And as I said, it's more recent, 2.8 to 2.9 billion years ago. Old time stuff. I'll start one on one end, one on the other. <coughs> and when you look at it, it's like you're looking at iron. Pretty dense stuff. Michigan, full of iron. And this is that specular type banded iron formation from Michigan. Boy, look, he ate the leaves. <laughs> Charcoal. Here in Connecticut, well, here in New England, they cut down forests, pile the wood up, starve the fire for air, piling leaves and dirt on top of it. A guy was sleeping in a shed to make charcoal to fire the blast furnaces. Whole forest disappeared to make charcoal. That's some I made in my wood stove. Yeah. <laughs> the iron product itself, as it's refined out of the blast furnace, is poured into sand troughs. A little molding sand fellow clay in it. You could create the trough with a hoe. They actually had some patterns. They would press them to the sand. Now, out in Kent, you have the Sloan Stanley Museum on Route 7. Behind it stands one of our old glass furnaces. Also, out there is the Connecticut Antique Machinery Association, CAMA. They will be opening May 1st. They're going to have live steam running the equipment in the industrial building. One of the steam trains will be running. It's a good event if you can get out there. They also have the Connecticut Mining Museum there. Recently, tree topples over. They clean that up. All right, I pass this one on. Really dusty. They found an iron pig. Pig iron. It was broken off from the main trench called the sow, and of course it's the pig. It was piglets. 
and this is the product, a very raw type of iron. You start putting things over on the table, over on the edge, rather than pass it around. That sounds alone. A fellow called Jack Kowalski, he discovered it. He's the president of the association out there and runs the mining museum. Wrote a book on the history of Connecticut mining. In the book are all kinds of pictures, as these books tend to be. A lot of pictures of many of the glass furnaces. Um, I stumbled into a winery, the Land of Nod or something, winery along the road near the Pfizer pit, Dolomite pit, uh, which is where they got flux for the Beckley furnace, which was one of the blast furnaces out in that area. We stopped in, my son wanted to do a little wine tasting. They had a postcard wrap. And in it, local artists had done paintings that were reproduced as postcards with views of many of the old iron furnaces, the lime kilns, and such. So I scooped up the whole set in there and invited them to have with us also. Books, books, books. Mineralogy is big in what I do. Ironworks at Saugus. Hopewell Furnace in Pennsylvania. Another operating glass furnace. Pickens <coughs> of Springfield. Uh, I know we have this boundary dispute going back and forth. We have Lester Smith here, historian over in Sudfield. Uh, the boundary dispute at one time between Enfield and Sudfield. Um, but at any rate, on the other side of the river, there were ironworks, as well as there being ironworks here in Enfield. Skidico had a forge. They had a foundry that made plows. And <coughs> oh, by the way, <coughs> even tools for mining were made out of iron. Here's a drill head.
So we'll throw this over there. The nice part is we took the glossary out of it as well. But here are the operations that were in each dorset. Uh, my connection to that area is my daughter-in-law came from there. Her family still has a large farm on Route 7. Um, and they do the horse festival every summer. I have visited that particular furnace in East Dorset. It's in somebody's yard. And it's just like what we have here at Connecticut. These things were scattered all over New England. And they were large operations versus over in Southfield, smaller operations. Anywhere where there were materials available, but particularly water power to operate the machinery. 1800s? Yeah. So I guess goes way, way back. I don't think it started here in 1750. No. And the movie's going to show. You know, colonists came over. They needed laborers. So they took some prisoners out of Scotland and Ireland. Gee, shades of Australia, I guess. And they put them to work. When Slogus closed, because it wasn't quite economically feasible enough for the governors, <clears throat> the Irish, the Scots moved out and they started working all over New England. Some of them had built their own furnaces. They had the skill to do the labor to get it up and going. Sunny Brook, Suffield, Mills along Stony Brook. Some iron collected out of the bottom of the brook. You can see it's a pretty raw material. It's further refined in a blacksmith's forge. Or he melts it down again and purifies it more. Then it would be work and a trip hammer might have gone to a slitting mill on the canal eventually. Or he might have turned it into horseshoes or who knows what. Or as they did in Skitko, the plowshare. But that's an actual piece from Stony Brook also down on the lower mill. It's fun to have friends like say archaeologists who own new things and do things. One of the largest areas involved with iron was up in Salisbury. Very good mine, mine hill ore. The limonite, as they would dig it, it would look like little stalactites, black stalactites hanging from the ceilings of cavities. You go out there now, it's still the iron bank that's running. The financial bank is called the iron bank. This is something from uh, the historical documentation of Connecticut Canal Historic Park, and it mentions that the widespread colonial saw, grist, and pulling mills arose almost everywhere that skill, money, and adequate water power were available. Less common industries, more dependent on natural resources, or regional locations also emerged in the Enfield Rapids vicinity. Suffield shallow wetlands included bog ore, from which three local water power bloomeries made wrought iron tools for predominantly local needs from the early 18th century into the early canal era. One of the
of the operation, Luther Loomis and Ella Foxon are reported to have made shovels for sale to Enfield Canal contractors. An ironworks in Enfield, established on the Scantic River in 1802, made agricultural implements until 1860 or so. <laughs> and the inset in the old Enfield map, Skidiko area, you can see listed from Blacksmith Shop, J. King Plow Shop, and Clark and King. Charles Clark, born 30 September 1797 in Columbia, Connecticut. Died 3 April 1867 in Enfield. Mr. Charles Clark was in business at Skidico, town of Enfield, with his father-in-law, Captain John King, for many years in the forge business, and afterwards was engaged with his brother-in-law, Clavantine King in manufacturing plows, the trade largely in the south. And you have brought us a picture of one of the buildings this evening also. If we may, I'm going to put it over on the counter with the book. I'm going to get to the movie shortly. More items. Um, the tools that built America. Got some old tools on the table. Most of them were my grandfather's. Museum of Early American Tools by Eric Sloan. And you'll see some neat stuff in there. I have some brochures out for Connecticut Antique Machinery Museum and the Kent Iron Company. This sold pig iron, made pig iron. Um, well, I thought they said iron pigs. <laughs> Oh, you even so old nails. It said my father got a 
I like your old ones when the house was torn down in Hartford. And of course, iron was used in making everything for the railroads, including the wheels for the locomotives. Uh, Vermont had an operation that cast locomotive wheels. Portland Chuck and Windsor Locks actually made big lathe trucks that would hold the wheels for a locomotive so that they could be turned in a lathe to cut them to true circle. So you've got your own nails. But uh, the other ones are better. This, this one looks almost like it could have been machine made rather than hand made. This one I stumbled on. And somewhere in all my stuff are those other handmade nails. All right, I'm going to attempt to get the movie going again. It's a nice video done for Saugus, showing how it operated, some of its history, which is typical to all the other histories of all these other blast furnaces. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a new video also made about the canal town. Um, it's a fairly good job. So, would you repeat again uh, where this museum is and what time it will be open? Okay. On first. On May 1st, they will open, I believe, at 10 o'clock, <coughs> and they'll be open until about 5. And what time? 10. Okay. Yep. Um, you can take Route 44 out of Winston all the way to Route 7 and take a nice jaunt down Route 7 until you come to Kent Falls State Park. Beyond it, on the west side of Route 7, you'll see some railroad tracks and a locomotive and a driveway and no big flags. Actually, there are so many people there for their uh, major weekend events. Uh, they'll be directing traffic. Is it open every day or just weekends? It's open weekends. Weekend. Uh, somebody's usually around during the week because Sloan Stanley is one of the few state operations that will be opening on Thursdays. Realize that Newgate is closed for renovations and not opening. And it's a sad thing that some of these historical resources aren't opening. Uh, I know that they operate with seasonal staff that aren't paid a lot of money and get no benefits, and I can't understand why they cannot be afforded with the admissions that they're able to, to charge. They're not large admissions, but it helps to sell the fund. So you're probably going to see a lot more business this year at your museum. And yours. Don't forget to cross the river and go see Lester's new barn. Pride and joy. Thank you. And again, there are brochures over here with directions also. Let's see if we can make it work.
make that fix. Well, most of you agricultural people aren't going to be stumped by Haynes. The rains go through the rains and there are hooks to tether to the wagon. Traces go through the rains. These are cast iron. Usually they were wood and they had some metal implements added to it. But these are cast iron. Here's an old iron one. Not in very good condition, but it has something unique about it. Remember the boundary dispute? Tony and Lester are going to arm wrestle later to say whose museum will get this eventually. Because it came from King's Island. They farmed out there. I got that back in the late 50s when I was out there as a kid. Where's that? Pardon? It's the big open river. It's that huge island out in the river between Suffield and Windsor Lock. Or Suffield yes. and Denfield. The largest non floating island in the river. Okay, yeah. on the river. I'll tell you about the Cary Island. Cary Island, 113 feet tall. Look for the book coming in uh, September.
Rivers up in Stafford Springs, and they mined up in Stafford Springs. A lot of that iron came down through the foundry on the canal in Windsor Locks. Um, Horton Company and Associates to the Hortons of actually uh, produced rifles for an armory there on the canal uh, under a contract to William Muir rifle during the Civil War. Um, we just did a history program in Windsor Locks. And they did lots of stuff. Um, here's a catalog cover of what work we did. But they did have the uh, contract for making Civil War rifles as well. And it was the William Muir and the UIR rifle. They have one in the Winter Locks Historical Society. Uh, Jerry was able to get some nice pictures uh, offline and uh, we just showed it in the history of Old Main Street uh, last month down in North Carolina. Well, I've heard two explanations for the decline of the Northwestern Connecticut iron industry. And one had to do with the discovery of the Wasabi Range out in the Midwest, which was a wonderful, rich source of iron ore. That's that specular banded stuff. And the other had to do with the final depletion of the forest that created the charcoal. Do you understand how those were might have been related to each other or which was the more important? Probably the charcoal. Whatever they did, they wanted local resources. They didn't want to haul stuff in from somewhere else. Uh, you know, Connecticut became quite agricultural out in the hills after the forest declined. They've all grown back now. But they're not original forest by any means. There's not much in the way of virgin forest in Connecticut. Uh, even the island where you would think it would be untouched was logged off after the 38 hurricane. Um, big thing uh, that more native kind of iron, you didn't have to refine it quite as much. <coughs> This stuff just looks like iron to begin with, so you're taking a little bit of rock stuff out of it, but not as much as taking some dirt out of a swamp and melting that whole mess down and getting more slag than iron. So economics come into play, but transportation is a big one. At Saugus, they have a little bay. They found the flux rock right on an island just outside the bay. They had water power from the river, <coughs> so it was ideal. They even built a replica of the scout-type boats that they used to haul the iron out as flat bars. Uh, you can make the trip to Saugus. Hey, it's a free place to go. Uh, it cost a couple hours to get there, but um, Tremendous uh, museum, living museum. It's operating. It's operating. They've got a seven inch nail and they make the nails and yep. get the nails and so on. Great. All right. <clears throat> Bill has uh, many iron items on the table. And, yep. uh, of course, they've aged. And we have to think back to. The making days. Of course, there are very few areas where you can get the ingredients for making iron. But there were many blacksmith shops that would take that iron and form it into various items there. Uh, and we did have a number of blacksmith shops in this area. Uh, he had the photo that he showed of a red building. That building was still on Skateco Street, right? Larry Road. No, Larry Road, I'm sorry. Uh, that building is a little apartment house now. Yeah. It's an oversized two-car garage, really. <laughs> and uh, it is still out there. There's a, I think there's a Polish woman living in there. Uh, of course, there are 
reflects the chop. I, I personally know it reflects the chop that was on Elm Street. Uh, and there was another big one, and I think the last one, that was on uh, Enfield Street, across from Town Hall, modern day Town Hall. That one burned down in my day, but I would say perhaps uh, in the 40s, early 50s. Uh, and unfortunately, I was told that that building was set back, Merrill Dodge was in front, and this building was set back. And uh, in my days, I was told that there was a complete blacksmith shop equipment still there. And of course, with the extreme heat, you know what happened with the iron. Unfortunately, it all went to the dump somewhere. That's a shop for relatively primitive, though, compared to uh, the gun making. Yeah, let's say we're between the two towns. Yeah, you'll see some items over there that are hand rock. They're ready. They pumped me. Well, I was in back of the shop. In fact, uh, my family had a forge yeah. on River Road in Winter Lodge. But there's part of one of those multi-piece plows. It's uh, the point, and then other pieces are added. The wings are built on out, uh, and if you come into the Henry Ford kind of thing with replaceable, interchangeable parts. Great to have another organization. Betty has a question. At the 1869 map, we have a place map shows a fort being, let's say, between Bailey Road and Literary Road. The location was there. The building, it's all swamp land now. Thank you. 